a strengths-based approach to family therapy, the Ohio State University College of Social Work. When a child or adolescent exhibits behavior that is experienced as problematic by their parents and other adults, they are usually viewed as having something wrong with them, that the problem is due to some psychopathology that resides within them. Often, when this occurs, the young person is taken to a mental health professional where they are given a diagnosis and perhaps individual psychotherapy. In social work practice, we are advised to take a person-in-environment approach when working with clients. That is, positive change or problem resolution is more likely to occur when intervening with the person, their environment, and the interactions between the person and their environment. In working with young people with problems, research is now supporting the benefits of working with the family, especially the parents or parent figures together with the young person. From this family system's perspective, the family is the client and not just the individual young person who has the identified problem. From this perspective, then, we can get more accomplished in a shorter period of time by working with the child or adolescent with the presenting problem and their parents, parent figures, or other adults with whom they are in regular contact together rather than separately. Many families who become clients of clinical social workers have multiple problems and have had these problems for a long period of time. Clients such as this have been referred to as having problem-saturated stories. Humans are storytelling beings. We tell and retell stories about our lives, the lives of others, to organize our lives and to make meaning of them. If clients have multiple problems and have been diagnosed with a mental disorder, then the primary stories they tell and are told about them, especially by professionals in the social and mental health services, are about their problems and diagnoses. The presumption then is that these clients have psychopathology residing within them. They suffer from cognitive distortions, dysfunctional thoughts, irrational thinking, and they are seriously lacking in skills of living, such as problem-solving skills, interpersonal skills, anger management skills, etc. What professionals and clients themselves often overlook are the strengths or the competencies, skills, and assets clients already have. In recent years, a growing body of research and scholarship is supporting the importance of clinicians focusing primarily on identifying and amplifying the strengths of families rather than trying to remediate their deficits or correct their cognitive distortions and or teach them skills. This video is a demonstration of how to combine family systems perspective and a focus on client strengths to solve a presenting problem and finding solutions for a 16-year-old adolescent. The family in this video is a composite of many families with whom Dr. Susan Salzberg and Dr. Gil Green have worked with over the years. Thank you for coming. Please be comfortable and I hope you found the office okay. Yeah, the directions were clear. The therapist is beginning the process of connecting with the family and helping them feel at ease and welcome in the therapy process. In strengths-based therapies, the therapist strives to become acquainted with the family members and engage them in social conversation about their lives before moving into talking about problems or solutions. During this joining process, the practitioner engages the family as a collaborator in their work together. Obviously, we don't know each other, but it says from the brief intake sheet here that Bill is it okay to call you Bill? Yeah, please call me Bill. And you can call me Jane, and this is our son, Joe. It's nice to meet all of you. It says here, Bill, that uh, you are 45 and work construction. Is that correct? That's right, but I'm not working right now. Oh, so you're currently not working in construction? No, there's just no work out there. It's the economy. Things are hard for everybody these days. That must be very difficult. 
especially when you have the experience and the skills for that sort of work. <laughs> Tell me about it. It says here, Jane, that you are 35 and a waitress. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Fortunately, I still have a job. I've worked at the same restaurant for the past seven years. And before that, I've waitressed at several other restaurants in town over the years. You must enjoy that kind of work. A people person. Yeah, I do. And it's what I know. It says here, uh, Joe, that you're 16 and a junior in high school. Is that correct? Yeah. What high school do you go to? Harriet Tubman High School. How's school going? So-so. What's your favorite part of school? Not, not much. Do you have a favorite subject? He's always really liked reading and writing and has written some really good things, especially poetry. Wow, that takes a lot of creativity to write poetry. It's a unique art form. I'd like to hear more about your poetry writing. Well, not only is he not doing that, he's not doing a lot of other things. But he hasn't even been going to school much for the past few months. Yes. Here you have a kid who's good at school, smart, and he won't go. That's what it says here on the intake sheet. But other than that, I don't really know the situation with school. So what's going on that you'd want to come and see someone like me? The therapist does not immediately focus on the father's concerns with an overly serious or knowing response, but rather turns to the family as a whole to fill him in on the concerns they want to address in therapy. In asking the question in this way, the therapist conveys to the family that he is open to hearing their take on what is going on and comes to the session with no preconceived assumptions or hypotheses. Asking the question this way attempts to begin the process of co-constructing change with the family, that they are people who have or can have a sense of personal agency. Well, I, I mean, we, Bill and I, we're really worried about Joe. I mean, we're really upset. He's changed in the past several months. <laughs> it seems like things are just getting worse. How so? Well, as we just said, he doesn't want to go to school anymore. <laughs> it's a struggle to get him up in the morning and get ready for school. I set his alarm clock and he turns it off. I go in and start trying to wake him up and he just ignores me. <sighs> then I try pulling off the covers and coaxing him out of bed, but all he wants to do is sleep in the mornings and be left alone. <sighs> Most mornings, I can eventually get him up, but there are some mornings when I just have to leave him in bed because I have to get to work. And on those days, he usually just stays home all day and misses school. And I've been late too many times, as it is. Every morning is a battle, leaving me out of sorts before I even leave the house, and then upset when I'm at work, and I'm the only one who has to deal with it. It's getting to the point now where he's missed a lot of school, and we're getting calls and pressure from the school to get him there. And his grades have gone downhill from A's and B's to D's and F's. Sounds like a very stressful way to begin everyone's day. Is this something new or has Joe always been someone who likes to sleep in? Well, he's never been an early bird, if that's what you mean. But not wanting to go to school and stay in bed all day, yeah, that is new. He didn't used to be that way. And he also doesn't care about being with his friends anymore. He just seems really detached from everything. Bill, what's your take on the situation with Joe? Well, Jane's pretty much said it. We're really worried about him, but we don't know what to do. Everything's a struggle these days. So what do you do on those mornings when Jane has to leave Joe in bed in order to get to work on time? <laughs> Nothing, really. I figure if Jane can't get Joe up, Joe isn't going to get up for me. Joe, 
What about you? What do you think's going on? I don't, I don't know. It, 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 it's like, what's the use of talking about it? It's, I, just, I just don't care about anything. It sounds like giving up has taken control of your life and is with you today at our meeting. What do you mean? Well, it sounds like you're saying giving up has taken all the good and enjoyable things out of your life. What do you think? Does this sound like what's happening? This is the beginning of the process of externalizing the problem. Externalizing is the process of using language to separate the problem from the person by placing the problem's location outside the person. We do this by personifying or objectifying the problem in such a way that we look to highlight how the problem is creating interference in the person's and family's life as a force external to them, to whom they are as people. Doing this communicates that the person isn't the problem, but rather the problem is the problem. I, I don't know. Mom and Dad, what is your take on the situation? You mean like Joe is so depressed that he's feeling hopeless? Yes, like hopelessness has taken all the good out of Joe's life. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And I guess I get what you mean. Like, Joe used to like to go to school and write poetry and be involved in things. And now it seems like something has taken that away from him. What sort of specific things is hopelessness interfering with in Joe's life? Well, for one thing, Joe and I used to talk to each other all the time about all kinds of things. Like, what's going on in Joe's life and what's going on in mine. And we also had a couple of favorite TV shows that we used to watch together, but we don't do any of those things anymore. He stays in his room most of the time. You know, I've tried many times to get him to come out of his room to talk to me or just watch TV together, but nothing seems to work now. His interest and energy seem zapped, and I really don't know what to do anymore. Once problems are externalized in the therapeutic conversation, we can develop storylines that depict how the problem has had negative effects on persons' and families' lives. Helping people think about how the problem is keeping them from having healthy, happy lives aids them in thinking about ways to free themselves from the problem's influences and destruction. Remember, both mother and father have stated all of the activities that Joe used to do and is no longer doing. So we are building our externalizing conversation on understanding the effects of the problem on Joe and the family as a whole. This is called mapping the effects of the problem on the person and the family. The more we learn about the effects of the problem, the more we are deconstructing the problem story. Also, asking what effect has the problem had on you, rather than how does that make you feel, is more likely to reinforce a sense of personal agency for them individually and as a family. Before you noticed them zapped from Joe, how did interest and energy fill his life? Oh, he used to be interested in all kinds of things going on in the world, like homelessness and the environment. Things like that he used to write about in his poetry and volunteer at school to help with these causes. Joe and Bill, how do you view hopelessness having interfered with your relationship with Joe? Well, Joe has always been sort of a daddy's boy. He always had this certain special relationship. We used to do funny things and Jane would call us the two goofballs and look at us funny. <laughs> <laughs> I was always the one that was able to get Joe to laugh, to get him from not being so serious about life. Because he's sort of a serious kid. He would take the problems in the newspaper, you know, the problems of the world to heart. I was the one that was always try to get to his cellular side. But we haven't done much joking around lately. We haven't even gone to see a movie together. I guess that what you would call hopelessness 
has changed all that. There's a part of me that thinks that maybe we're all feeling a little hopeless. Does that include you as well, Bill? Yes, it does. Especially me. I've been pretty discouraged about not finding work. Would it be all right if I asked you a few questions about feeling discouraged? Before moving forward with this line of questioning, the therapist wants to see if this is all right with the parent. The family came in identifying Joe as having the problem. As the session progresses, the systemic nature of family problems is emerging. In striving to respect people's right to discuss what it is they want to focus on in therapy, the strengths-based therapist asks father if it is okay to continue with this line of questioning. The therapist is continuing to take a non-hierarchical position in the relationship with the clients. Yeah, sure. I'm wondering, Bill, if you're feeling discouraged because you don't believe you're going to find a job or because you don't believe you have the skills, or is there something else teaming up with hopelessness that's keeping you feeling so low? Well, it, it's, it's a lot of things. I'm supposed to be the man of the house. I'm supposed to provide for my family, and I've let them down. It's the bills, the stress on Jane, it's, I can't see how, I can't even try, even motivate myself to try to do anything about it. It's just that I don't see how this is ever going to get better. That does sound very difficult. You've got both hopelessness and guilt beating you up at the same time. Do you ever think about trying to escape their grasp? This validates the father's experiences. In addition, it opens up space in the conversation for the family especially the parents, to identify times when they may resist the influence of the problem on their lives. The therapist notes these acts of self-agency. It's all just so, so frustrating. It's just, I, I can't take it anymore. I don't see how it's ever going to change. I can't, it's just so... See, it's, it's, it's hard to feel good when, when dad can, still can't find a job and they're both so stressed about bills all the time. I, I mean, what, what is it to feel good, good about? Joe, what is hopelessness trying to tell you as you see it taking over your dad's life? Well, when I think about uh, how, how my dad's situation is being experienced by a lot of people because of how the economy sucks, it's, it's like this hopelessness is just getting louder and louder. What? messages are getting louder and louder through hopelessness. What is it saying? Like it's no use. Like, like I'm, I might as well not have any plans or dreams because it's, it's not going to happen. That sounds very scary. I'm wondering if hopelessness, what is hopelessness saying to you as well, Dad? As I sit here with all of you, I'm wondering if hopelessness has found a way to wedge itself into your family and affect the family as a whole, not just Joe. Does hopelessness take away your hopes for the future as well? When we are engaged in externalizing conversations, we are looking to name and define the problem as an external force, map the effects of the problem on the lives of the family members, and evaluate the effects of the problems. In doing this, we are building a scaffold from which to begin to construct the alternative storyline or exceptions to the problem. <laughs> sure does. What do you think it would take to tune out the pessimism of hopelessness? I don't know. So let me ask you, on a scale of zero to 10 where Zero is where hopelessness has completely can taken control of your life and is interfering with your relationships with each other. And 10, where hopelessness is completely gone and you are filled with hope. Where would you say that you are on that zero to 10 scale? Scaling questions can help the family place a measurable value on a scale from zero to 10 of where the exceptions to the problem stand in their lives and estimates of future possibilities. The scaling question can be used to further break the problem down into manageable pieces, 
and also to collaboratively monitor progress with the family. Though all family members are struggling, the parents came in because of their concerns about Joe. So at this point, we want to keep the focus on what they are customers for. I, I don't know. That's a good question. Now, are, are you referring to just Joe or to us as a family? Because we're here because Bill and I were very worried about Joe and we don't know what to do anymore. Yes, I, I understand that. I, your primary worry is Joe. So, okay, where is Joe? Where would you rank him on that zero to 10 scale? I guess I would say maybe a two. I haven't really thought about it that way till now, but I'm very worried about Joe. Actually, I'm very worried about all of us. How about you, Bill? Where would you rank Joe on that same scale? I agree with Jane. I would probably put him at a two about right now. Joe, I'd like to hear from you on this. Where are you on that same scale? Please, Joe, it's important to your father and I to know how you feel about things. Probably out of, th out of three. So, now I'd like to get a glimpse of what your life might be like if hopelessness was no longer an intruder in your family. To do this, I'm going to ask you a very different question, one that might seem a little strange, but stay with me on this. Suppose that after our meeting today, you go home and go to bed, and while you're sleeping, a miracle happens, one that takes away your problem. It just disappears like magic. The problem is gone. Because you're sleeping, you don't know that a miracle has happened, but when you wake up tomorrow, you feel very different. How will you know that that miracle has happened? What will be the first thing you notice that will tell you that hopelessness is no longer an intruder in your family? Asking the miracle question is a very useful and creative way for clients to describe their desired future without the problem, which is really a way to do goal setting. However, not only is asking the miracle question helpful in the client setting a well-defined goal, but it is something very new and very different for almost all clients, and thus it is an intervention itself. It is necessary to ask clients follow-up questions to get them to describe the miracle picture as concretely, specifically, and with as many behavioral indicators as possible. Also, it is best to ask the miracle question in a way so the client begins the miracle picture as soon as possible after waking up in the morning. In asking the miracle question in family therapy, address the question to the family as a whole and then ask follow-up questions of every family member to get them involved in describing the morning and day after the miracle. Involving every family member in this process also creates a thicker description of the miracle picture and thus helps in co-creating a counter story and desired change. In this example, externalizing the problem is integrated into the miracle question. You're right about that being a strange question, <laughs> but it's a good one. You know, it really makes you think. I think I would notice that Joe is not still in bed asleep. So, if Joe is out of bed, what is he doing instead? Well, I think the first thing I would notice is that Joe is already up and out of bed. And how would you know that? What, what would you see or hear that would tell you that Joe is up and out of bed? I would hear him in the shower and getting ready to go to school. So when Joe is up, out of bed, getting in the shower, getting ready for school, what difference would that make for you? I would be very, very happy. I don't remember the last time Joe got up on his own. So when Joe is up on his own, what will others notice in the family that will tell them that you're feeling very happy? I think they will see me in the kitchen making some breakfast for everyone. And Joe. How will you know that a miracle has happened during the night while you were asleep in bed? 
Do you really want to know? Yes. Well, um, to, to be honest with you, I, I would notice that my parents weren't arguing with each other. So when they're not arguing, what are they doing instead? Notice that throughout asking the follow-up, 